Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Undiscovered Games Video Podcast, where we take a look at the lesser known board games of the world and share those with you. For episode 16 today, we're going to look at this 1993 gem from Dr. Reiner Knizia called Tutankhamen. Now my edition here is from 2004, published by Out of the Box Games. This is my favorite edition of the game. And the game of Tutankhamen is for two to six players, ages eight and up. The goal of the game is to be the first player to deposit all of their little coins here into Tut's tomb. To do so, you're going to be moving your pawn along this pathway, collecting Egyptian artifacts, and you'll score points if you have majorities in these different sets. As you score the points, you'll deposit your coins into this nifty little pyramid here, and the first player to deposit all of their coins will win the game. And this is going to be more of a filler game, 20 to 30 minutes or so, but the decisions are fantastic in this game. It uses this neat little movement mechanism where you can move as far forward as you want on your turn, but never backwards. And it creates a great tension and a player-driven pace, a great push and pull between the players. It's just that classic Reiner Knizia, super simple rules, but tough, tough decisions type of a game. And this one does it perfectly. Now, this was reprinted recently in 2021 by 25th Century Games, and they spelled it slightly differently. They spelled it U-N instead of E-N, which I guess is the more modern spelling. However, it's essentially the same game. It's just a way overproduced version of the same game, and it does have some rules changes, which I'm not a huge fan of. But more importantly, visually, this old school version is the way to go, in my opinion. If you stay tuned to the end of the video, I will do a comparison and show you more of that new version. So let's take a look inside the box and then I'll teach the game as well as talk about it. First, we're gonna find the rules here. It's very easy to understand. And I love that they keep the scoring rules completely separate in this game. It makes it seem a little less intimidating when you first open that rule book. And it's just a little psychological trick, but it does make the game more approachable. Here we have these beautiful wooden pawns. I love the old school vibe that these give, and it just takes you back to that simpler time in board gaming. I do have one minor complaint with these. I like that they use these earthy tones, but the tan and the gold piece are very similar in color. So sometimes those can be a little confusing. And if you're playing with less than six players, just don't use both of those colors. The out of the box logo is on every one of these little tiddlywinks coins. That's kind of neat, old school as well. Nothing fancy, but it gets the job done. This plastic pyramid has a coin slot in the back and that is the centerpiece of the game. And here we have all the different artifact tiles. Now I get it, the art is not great on these tiles, but it is very functional. And you'll see why that's important here in a minute. And I like the box because it has this little slot as you remove those tiles from the game, you sort of clean the game up as you play. It's kind of a nice little touch they added there. On the bottom, you'll see 2004 Out of the Box Publishing. And again, this is my favorite edition and it's pretty easy to find as of now. To set up the game, find the tut tile. It's the triangle with the coin at the bottom. It's the only one shaped like a triangle in the whole box. That goes on the pyramid and the pyramid goes off to the side somewhere. Now you're gonna mix all these tiles face down and then start building out a random pathway by flipping these tiles face up and sort of snake that pathway around the table however you want. It's a little time consuming, but not too bad. Everybody gets a player color and their pawn goes at the start of the path and you will be moving toward the tomb. Finally, you're gonna give each player a certain number of coins based on this table in the rule book. So for a four player game, everybody starts with 20 coins each. And you can see that's different depending on how many players are playing the game, but that's the only thing that changes for player count. Here we have a four player game set up. Everybody has their coins. You're gonna set the box next to the board and as you remove tiles from the game, just chuck them back in the box. That kind of cleans the game up as you go. You're going to be moving your pawn along this pathway, always in a forward direction. And ultimately, when you reach the tomb, you can't go any farther. Now let's take a brief look at these artifact tiles. They all work pretty much the same. They're gonna be a color, a symbol, and a number. So this is a green dude and there's eight of them. So the eight shows how many green dudes are on the path as well as how many points that set is worth. So if you have the most green dudes when it's time to score, you'll get eight points. As you move your pawn, you will stop on a spot and collect the tile and you will leave your pawn there. And then you'll check to see if it's time to score. 
if you score points, you deposit your little coins here into the back of this pyramid. So however many points you score, you put that many coins into the pyramid and that counts down your score. It's kind of a race to run out of coins. The first player to run out of all their coins will win the game. So it's kind of a fun little way to keep track of the score. It's a little gimmicky, but I will say it's oddly satisfying to hear the clank of those coins when you drop them into the pyramid. It's just kind of fun. And I'll talk more about scoring here in a minute, but first we're gonna look at your turn. Your turn consists of three steps. First, you're gonna move along the path, then collect a tile and possibly score, then possibly remove tiles from the game and possibly score those. To move your pawn, you can move as far along this pathway in a forward direction as you want. You can never move backwards. You must move at least one space forward and you must land on a tile. So if it was the tan player's turn to go first, they could move up to say this red tile here and then you immediately collect that tile. So you take that tile into your possession and then your pawn stays in the empty spot. Now this is the most important thing to remember in this game, anytime you remove a tile from the pathway, you have to check to see if scoring happens. And the way you do that is you look at the symbol that was just removed, so red dudes here, and you see if there's any more of them left on the pathway. Here, there are some left, so scoring does not happen yet. But if that would have been the last red dude removed from the path, then scoring happens. Just have to always remember to check that. The black player here is just gonna jump a couple spaces ahead and take this purple bird. And I don't know if these are gonna be the best strategic moves. I'm just trying to show you how this game plays. Next is the white player's turn, and they're gonna jump up. They see these two red birds kind of close together here, so maybe they could get two of those potentially. So they're gonna jump in and take one red bird. Again, the four means there are four total red birds out there, and that set is worth four points. The gray player here is going to jump up and take one of these pharaoh tiles. Now I haven't talked about these yet, but these are wild. These can be used for any symbol when you determine scoring. I'll talk more about those later, but let's talk about artifact removals. After you move your pawn, you check to see if there's any tiles behind everyone else. So nobody can go backwards. These tiles all get removed from the game, starting with the farthest away from the pyramid, and then moving forward. And just like before, you have to check to see if it's the last one on the path. And if it is, then scoring happens for those sets as well. Now let's just get a few turns underway here. So the tan player is looking at these red dudes out there and there's one there. Now they could jump up and get that Pharaoh tile, which may be the better move, I'm not sure, but let's just take this red tile here. So they have two now. So they're trying to get a majority of those. Remember there's only eight total. So they're well on their way there. The black player here is gonna jump up. Now, remember, they're collecting purple birds. The next purple bird is way up here and they don't wanna waste all that movement. So again, they could jump up and take that, but they're passing over a lot of tiles that they'll never get to come back to. You really have to pace yourself in this game. It's all about pacing and timing. And you also have to watch what the other players are doing. If you see another player getting a head start on like those big eight point sets, you know, you can't let somebody run away and get those eight pointers. You have to challenge them sometimes. And that really affects your decisions. Now let's say the white player collects the second red bird here. Once again, you check, are there any red birds left? Yes, there are, so no scoring happens. But now we remove any tiles that are left behind. So here we remove this blue cat. Now there's only two of those on the whole path. So is the other one still out there? Yes, it is. No scoring happens yet for that set. Next is the gray player's turn, and they're looking at these blue dogs because there are three blue dogs that are pretty close together here. You always wanna be efficient. You know, if you can get a lot of some set without moving too far, that's a pretty good efficient movement. And they have that Pharaoh tile too, which could be used as a wild to count as another blue dog. So the tan player is looking at these red dudes, but they already have two. So maybe now's the time they wanna challenge this player on their blue dog majority. So maybe the tan player sneaks in and takes this blue dog so the other player cannot get it. 
And this is the kind of stuff you really have to do in this game. You can't just play solitaire the whole time. And I love that type of player interaction in board games, and it can be cutthroat at times, so keep that in mind, but it's only a 20 to 30 minute game, so it's not gonna last forever. This player is looking over here at this red dude majority and they're thinking, you know what? Now I'm gonna challenge because I have a pharaoh tile and that can be used as a wild. So now all of a sudden they can, they're potentially tied for majorities in those red dudes. And there's this constant back and forth, you know, weighing these types of decisions throughout this entire game. It's just moving to a spot and collecting a tile, but it's way more than that. And you also need to decide if you want to hang back and sort of take the tiles that other players didn't want or jump way ahead and get first dibs like this blue dog here. This player is going to have to jump pretty far ahead and skip a bunch of tiles. But let's say they do that. They want to get out in front of the pack just so they can guarantee to get that blue dog. And that's another neat decision to weigh on your turn. There's a lot of that in the game. It's a very subtle, simple system, but it works brilliantly. And you can really feel that tension every time you play this. I would say this is another one of those classic Reiner Knizia games that just sums up his style perfectly. We're looking at Redbirds here. Tan player wants to try to jump in and challenge the Redbird majority. Another neat thing is there's so many different sets out there. You kind of, you know, do you want to overextend yourself and go for a bunch of different ones? Or do you want to just focus on a couple? So many great little subtle decisions in this game. Perfect example here with the black player. There's two purple eights back to back. That's so tempting to go for those. However, the black player is challenging the tan player for red majorities they're gonna jump ahead take this next red tile because they have a pharaoh which is a wild so now they have like three red eights and the tan player only has two red eights so now they have to decide do i want to stay in that hunt for red eights or do i want to abandon that route go somewhere else great decisions the white player here is going to steal another yellow dog so now they have two of the six and that's a great start on that majority Again, you always check, is that the last yellow dog on the path? Nope, there's one up there, so scoring does not happen yet. The gray player is trying to collect blue dogs, but the next blue dog is way up there. They don't want to waste all those tiles, so they're going to start looking at these green eight dudes because there's only one movement there, and they get a green eight. Now the tan player has a decision to make. Do they want to go for purple eights? Do they want to go for another red eight? Or do they want to end and score the red birds? Knowing the white player is going to get that red bird right there and get the majority, maybe the tan player wants to steal that red bird and tie for a majority. Because now all the red birds are taken. That is the last red bird on the path. That means scoring happens immediately for the red bird set. So there's four red birds total. You see who has a majority. In this case, we have a tie two there and two there. Now when scoring happens, you have to determine who has the most tiles in that set that is scoring. If only one player has the clear majority, then you go to column A. If two or more players tie for the majority, you go to column B and follow those steps. So in the A scenario here, let's say we're gonna score these purple eight dudes and one player has the most purple eights, they get eight points. Then you determine who has the second highest number of tiles in that set. So the second most purple eight dudes, they're gonna get half of the points, so four points to second most. If there's a tie for second most, those players score nothing. So if you can wrap your head around this scoring system, it really helps you make decisions, but it also complicates your decisions. Now in the B scenario, two or more players tie for having the majority. So again, we're going back to these red birds here. Two players have the majority. In this case, each player scores half points. So two points to each tied player. Now, it's important to note that it's always half points to each tied player. So if you had like three players tied for first, each player would get half points. You don't divvy out the points evenly among the players. And finally, when there's a tie for majorities, nobody gets second place points. 
When you score your points, you deposit that many coins into the pyramid, starting with whoever had the majority and then going to the second place player. And the order in which you deposit your coins makes a big difference because if you are the first player to deposit all your coins, you immediately win the game. So you wanna make sure you do that in order as specified by the rule book. After you score, all the scoring tiles are put back in the box and then play continues as normal wherever you left off. First, you do the cleanup phase, any tiles left behind the pawns get removed. And again, you gotta check to see if those are the last ones on the path. They are not, so scoring will not happen for that set. Then you just continue moving, collecting tiles, scoring as necessary. And like I said, the first player to run out of coins wins the game. Now let's show you like a two player scenario here. Let's say the white player moves up, takes this Pharaoh tile, which is a wild. Now let's show you how scoring might happen by removing tiles. First, you would remove the yellow dog. Nobody else can get to that. And you always remove the farthest one away from the pyramid first. Now we score yellow dogs. This player has two, this player has two. However, they could add one Pharaoh tile to that set, giving them six points all to themselves and three points to that player. If they didn't add the Pharaoh tile, they would each get three points. If you add the Pharaoh tile, that goes into the box after you score it. Next, we would remove this red dude here and then score the red set, same way. So just remember when you remove the tiles from the path, you always start farthest from the pyramid and go toward the pyramid. There are three special tiles I wanna talk about. There's the bag of gold, there's the Pharaoh tile, which we kinda of talked about, and then there's the King Tut tile. That's the one that's on the pyramid. First, let's talk about the bag of gold. When you collect the bag of gold, you can immediately spend it to basically steal a tile from another player. The only rule is you have to already have a tile from that set in your possession. So I could spend that and steal one of these red tiles because I already have a red tile in my possession. In return, that player gets to deposit one coin into the pyramid and this goes back in the box. The Pharaoh tile is just a wild, so that can be saved up and you can spend it whenever scoring happens. You could use it to get yourself the clear majority in a set of like eight points or something like that. You can use it however you want. The only rule is you must have at least one tile of that type. You can't use all wilds to make a set to score. And once you use it to score, it goes back in the box. So it's like a one-time use wild card. And the last special tile is the King Tut tile which sits there on the pyramid whenever you want to you can move there put your pawn on the ledge and take this tile this immediately lets you deposit one coin into the pyramid immediately and then you take this tile and it works just like a regular wild pharaoh tile but it gives you that extra coin to deposit but it also ends your movement as well once you land there you will no longer move in the game that will be the last tile you collect you still get to participate in the scoring rounds you just don't move any farther now before i show you the new edition and why i like this edition better i want to give you my rating on the 2004 version of tutankhamen this is an 8 out of 10. that's a very solid rating for a filler game this is only a 20 to 30 minute game but it offers you some incredibly awesome decisions from beginning to end and it's very interactive you really have to watch the other players kind of get in each other's way challenge each other and keep each other in check. And I think this game does it really well for how light and fast it plays. It's completely player driven, you know, players decide how far they wanna move up, you know, how fast they wanna push that pace. And I love having to consider, you know, do I go for my own set collection or do I go for other sets that other players are going for just to challenge them so they don't have a clear runaway majority with a certain set. Those decisions are great. You know, you got to decide if you want to jump way out in front of people and get first dibs on certain tiles, or if you want to hang back and kind of see what happens. Maybe scoop up some tiles that the other players overlooked. Really, really interesting decisions. This is Reiner Knizia at his finest. I love this type of game, and he's a master at these simple 
ideas that create tense, tough decisions between all the players. Now, I will say the game flow is a little bit choppy. There's a lot of scoring rounds, and they happen frequently, especially as you get later in the game. And it gets a little bit annoying from time to time. You know, it's like every time a tile comes off the path, you got to look and see, is this the last one? Does scoring happen now? Okay, scoring happens. Who has the most? Who has the second most? Oh, wait, there's a tie. Now you got to deposit your coins in the pyramid. And, you know, it can get a little bit, choppy because then after that you have to go back to where you were okay now we got to remove tiles from the board oh now we got to see if these oh one of these is going to score now let's see who has the most and then it's like where were we you know so there's a little bit of that but at the same time it's only a 20 to 30 minute game so it's not that big of a deal and I absolutely love the way this game looks on the table. I mean, look at the, the board snakes around like that. And, it's, and it looks different every time. You know, every time you set that up, you can kind of play around with the shape of the path. And obviously the tiles are going to come out in a different order every time. So that changes up the game. And the box is kind of interesting. It's very dull and drab. You know, the box isn't one that's going to catch your eye on the shelf, but it's an interesting shape. And for that tiny box to sprawl out on the table like this is pretty cool. And anybody walking by this game is gonna, you know, it's gonna catch their eye. And it's just kind of neat. You know, you have the pyramid, you put your coins in there, you hear the clank of the coins when you drop them in. And it just, I don't know, this game has a lot of charm to it. Even with that cheesy 90s artwork and look and everything, I will say this artwork is very, very functional. It's very important to be able to look out on the path and easily see what is left because scoring happens so often. If you can't visualize that at a glance, it's gonna be a long game. And that brings me to the reprint. The box is beautiful. I love the box and that's why I got a copy. But then when I opened it and saw this extremely long wordy rule book, that was my first red flag. And then I saw all these superfluous components that do nothing to the game except just add table fluff. That was another red flag. Now the wooden pieces, I was like, oh, these are cool. You know, look at all these, all these different wooden pieces. The boats replace the ponds and they're sailing down the river. That's kind of cool. And these little player uh, score markers here, <laughs> they hook on the edge of the box and this is how you track your score. Now, when I first saw this, I was like, oh, that's kind of innovative. Then I realized they didn't print the numbers. They only printed them every five spaces. But then when you try to like fiddle around with this, you get to the corner. It's like, is this a space? Uh, let me count again. Is that five spaces? I don't know. Then I got to jump to the side. And then these pieces are really hard to move. The box moves every time you try to move those. Um, if you have a lot of players playing, it blocks the numbers. I really don't like that. And I just think that was them trying to be gimmicky like the pyramid. But just redo the pyramid. The pyramid was cool. You know, why do you have to make a new gimmick? So whatever. That was one bad thing I didn't like. Now we get to the main flaw in this edition, and that is these tiles. They tried to make the Nile River. I appreciate that. That looks cool thematically. The problem is the artwork on these is extremely hard to see when it's all set up. And like I said, when scoring happens, you need to be able to glance out and quickly see, are there, is this symbol still out on the path? Do we need to score it? As you'll see here in a minute, when I set it up, it's really hard to tell. This game also adds um, some special power tiles, which are explained on these cards. Now, this is fine. I mean, if you like special abilities and things like that, this might be something for you. Um, I don't think this game really needed that. But what it does is it gives you these cards, and then when you collect those tiles, um, you have to refer to those cards, and the cards are very wordy, and it's kind of hard to remember what all those special powers do. So some symbology or iconography would have been nice there. Now look at this pathway and try to imagine glancing out and seeing, is scoring supposed to happen right now? Are there any of these things left? It is so busy looking. Now, if you just look at that, it looks kind of cool. But when you play the game and you realize how much you need to be able to quickly look out there and see what's left, it looks so busy. 
Now the boats, I do like the boats, but you know, this scoring thing combined with the river looking so busy and all these icons looking the same. And then when you get these special power icons, they look exactly the same, but they're not part of the set. Then you got to look at your special power card. Uh, I, I just, I was not a fan of this. Um, another thing is they changed some of the rules. Like you can move one space backwards now and it's just not necessary. The original game is so pure and clean and I don't know why you would mess with that, but I'm not trying to pick on 25th century games here whatsoever. They've put out some great games. It's just this, this is a perfect example of you know, modern reprints of old games and these companies thinking they have to go real flashy and, and just overproduce it. When in reality, a lot of people just want the game back in supply to, to be able to buy it again at a good price or maybe just revamp it slightly, like just make it look a little bit better, but you don't have to go completely over the top. And I feel like they just kind of <laughs> went overboard with the production on this and it it's not functional. That's the problem. You know, if you, if you make it functional, that's one thing, but this reprint, I am sorry, but it's just, it's a, it's a headache. You know, I, I will never play this edition. I will always play the 2004 version. It's so much easier on the eyes, even though the artwork is kind of boring. It's just so much more functional and my head does not hurt every five seconds. So that's my little soapbox on overproducing board games. I just thought this was a perfect example. And again, I want to reiterate, that is not a shot at 25th century games. It's just every board game company now is guilty of this, this overproduction. And I just think that maybe they ought to simplify things a little bit and go back to basics, you know, bring back the beige beauties. So that's my two cents. What's a game that you love that they reprinted and you like the original version better? I'd love to hear about that in the comments below. And also, have you ever played Tutankhamun? What did you think of it? Do you like that game? Has anybody out there ever played the uh, original German version of Tutankhamun? Because I haven't even seen that one. And I would be curious to see how that one compares to this 2004 edition that I featured today. And I got to give a shout out to this YouTube user who correctly commented. I asked in my last video if someone could correctly identify the one card in this picture that did not belong in the Menagerie set. And they correctly identified the Summon card, which is a promo card. So great job. You get the shout out and I appreciate you watching and commenting. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Uh, my voice is about to give out. Make sure you subscribe, like, share, comment. That really helps my channel grow. If you want to support the channel further, there's a PayPal link in the description below. You can donate any amount you like and that just helps keep this channel alive. Thanks again for watching, everybody. We'll see you on the next one.